We are going to start. We've we've only just made a small tweak that uh, Nandita, who was going to come last, it's 2 a.m. for her in the morning, so she's requested she goes first, but she'll be part of the panel discussion. So we'll start with the virtual presentations, and then we'll have the order as it was. So, Sari, you can uh, start next. And so let's uh, get going. And apologies to the Zoom attendees that we're running a few minutes late, but thank you for participating and you know, being with us for these conversations. So thank you, and let's get going. Lights dim. Okay, I'm gonna start. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you the cue, Nanata. Okay. I think so. Think you can start. Okay. Well, hi, and uh, thank you for inviting me to present the work of the Charles Correa Foundation. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity for foundations and institutes to be part of the discussion on architecture and the built environment, especially in the context of South Asia, as this entire region, for the most part at least, uh, is defined by our moment of collective independence from colonial rule. And that in itself brought about a distinct period of architecture. Now, seven decades later, many of the architects from this first generation have passed and their archives are with foundations or institutes that were set up to preserve their work and contribute to the cultural ethos. Of, of the place. So, so at this point in time, to be able to reflect on the focus of many of these foundations, the pedagogical approach that some of them um, are taking and learn from that collective experience is a great opportunity for all of us. So how are the archives being curated and for what purpose is fundamental to their raison d'etre? To begin with, what was unique about what Charles did when setting up the foundation was that he actually closed down his office earlier that year in 2011 because he felt that um, that he had practiced for, for several decades and now he wanted to spend time doing other things. He started the foundation uh, later that year in 2011 uh, to spend more time in Goa and um, as a way to, to also help the government there reimagine their state. He felt that a comprehensive regional plan that he was working on pro bono for the government, for the state, would lead to the right kind of urban growth. And in this context, imagined that the foundation might be supported by other philanthropic organizations and civil society. Um, he also spent a lot of time and effort trying to find um, uh, ways of, of making his archives accessible to the public. He spoke to institutions uh, in both Bombay, Mumbai and Delhi, but uh, was not convinced that the work would be thoroughly, um, you know, organized or curated. So he made digital copies of all the hand drafted drawings of which there were hundreds, I mean, you can imagine, um, and sent them to the RIBA in, in London. The foundation has the digital copies, the RIBA has the original drawings and models. And, and then he scanned his writings, his publications, photographs, and made them digitally accessible to scholars or students through schools and universities. I'm saying this to emphasize that it was a very conscious decision in uh, a sense, he did what foundations and people's names do after they pass away. Charles already did that in his lifetime. Uh, no, no one from the family was involved at that time. The trustees were all Goa-based. I was asked by the trustees later, a year or so after he passed away, so around um, 2016, I think, to take over as director. 
And I was very familiar with Charles's work and had worked very closely with him for over 30 years. Um, we have done several exhibitions, but the first one that we did was of Charles's unbuilt work. This was in Mumbai a year after he passed away during the State of Architecture exhibition. There were 88 unrealized projects that we found. And uh, we categorized them into lineages, illustrating how unbuilt projects nurture the idea of the building in perhaps a very pure state uh, without any encumbrances. You know, there no, they, they just stay there that way, a, a very beautiful kind of seminal idea. And, and many of these ideas got developed in a, in a later, you know, built project. But the significance of the unbuilt work to, to foster an idea is important. And we marked on a timeline, um, as you see on the screen, this big orange wall, um, the duration of each project, both built and unbuilt. And so the public could see how the unbuilt work influenced the, the, the built, just in chronological sort of sequence, understand exactly what was happening. We've done other exhibitions too, a traveling exhibition that went around many US universities and collaborated with TU Delft on a housing exhibition where they built beautiful models of many of his housing projects all at a one is to 50 scale. So you one got to see uh, these and it was, they were really quite an amazing exhibition that then came to India and traveled uh, to many cities in India, but was originally uh, in Delft. All these exhibitions engage with young architects and the general public interested in issues Charles thought were crucial to a developing country. We publish and sell books written by Charles and try to find ways for the profession, especially the young professionals, to engage with the archives. Um, but then we got thinking, really, what, what is an architect's archives? There are the tangibles, the drawings, models, photographs, writings. We try and recreate the context to, to say, for, for example, uh, these are the drawings from the early 1960s. So here's an early iteration of, of the project that we all know well, you know, in a later form. So that's that's what you know, we do in, in many of the, the exhibitions when we're looking through the archives to, to see these many uh, of theirs. But it is the intangibles, I think, you know, his legacy, his ideas, his thinking, his approach to design and relevance today. That's the new context where, um, where that approach is still valid, where we can um, all continue to learn from. And this, I think, is the true pedagogical opportunity that we can share. So we, we realize that we should focus on extending the spirit of his ideas. And as you might know, his interests were very broad from, from architecture to questions of larger urban issues to, to housing. So that's exactly what we have done. And so very quickly, I'll outline for you five projects that I just want to touch upon to give you a sense of that spectrum of related work. Um, first, we have our Z-axis um, conferences. It's a series, a, a biennial series, um, which deal with issues from architecture. Um, here we have buildings and, and, and climate, as form follows climate. As Charles wrote, um, as a provocation to architects in the early 1970s during the energy crisis, um, and, you know, and that was the focus of our conference last year in 2022. The designers who presented their work talked about today's context of climate change and designing ecologically sensitive uh, buildings. In 2018, designing equitable cities in a bid to reach design professionals and discuss the importance of equitability in our urban areas, something Charles felt was crucial to society. We looked at it from, from many vantage points, equitability within the legal framework, issues of housing, cooperatives, public transportation, the equi uh, equitability of gender, 
and necessary the necessity for women to feel comfortable in public spaces. So we, you know, we had we we had this as as the title for the for the conference, and I I think it was you know very well received. And then in in twenty twenty, the year of the pandemic, we looked at the city at four different scales, like Charles's sketch of the hierarchy of spaces, and we we called it "You and Your Neighborhood," which was also the title of his master's thesis at MIT, which was the first time. He made a film, and um, so using that rubric, we we looked at the city and design interventions that can be addressed at at the diff at the four different scales. Um, we uh, in in twenty twenty we also started producing a series of short films, seven minute long documentaries called Nagri. They are thematic, covering a range of urban issues from housing, livelihoods, water, uh, urban commons. Urban commons is this year's um, um, focus. We we change the focus year to year. The issues that are common problems in in really all of South Asia, or perhaps even the whole global South. Um, made by young filmmakers under the tutelage of mentors that that we um, uh, provide to to these filmmakers. We commission nine to ten films a year, and we have now almost forty films over the last four years. So as a collection over the years, perhaps we will you know we will be able to make a memorable record of everyday life in urban India. We've um, also made design proposals in and around Panjim, where we're located, dealing with traffic and water transportation. Say, uh, these were ideas Charles had, but we researched the feasibility of these and made proposals. Um, we we give the Charles Korea Gold Medal to the best fifth year under undergraduate thesis, the design thesis. This is. Something Charles started many years ago, but we've now opened it to all the schools across India. We've also made an archive of all the submissions we receive called the Storehouse, and it's available on our website. Students can, can search by typology or geographic region. You can zoom in uh, to actually see the specific site. We have the, the, um, the, the Google coordinates for that. Um, and we use this as, as, as a library for the thesis projects from across the country. It's very popular, I understand, and um, especially during their thesis prep uh, semester when they're putting you know, together to understand different programs and, and scale and how pe other previous students have dealt with these issues. Um, Dwell, uh, the housing workshops, that we uh, organize um, at our, at the foundation in Goa, using Charles's housing typologies to study densities, looking at alternate uh, carbon neutral materials, et cetera. Uh, this one was about the tube house, um, which was de designed for Ahmedabad in 1961 and has since been um, torn down. Um, uh, and and finally, a more recent project that uh, we've just started, but um, are yet looking for funding and volunteers listing significant 20th century modern architecture. We hope to get schools involved in documenting the buildings as the research component is significant. Without listing the buildings state by state and then getting the legislation through to protect them, Signing campaigns every time a building is going to get torn down is not going to work. We can't fight these in court as the legislation is just not there. So it's really imperative that we do this, and this is something the foundation has taken on. Um, I'd like to end with this drawing, the street elevation of our studio in Fontenia, Panjim. We are part of the urban fabric and always have our doors open to visitors, architects, planners, designers, and, and also concerned citizens interested in the built and the unbuilt environment. So if you're ever there, please drop by. Um, and I just want to say 
um, that I believe that these projects that I've just shared illustrate the role the foundation can play. One that complements pedagogy in a place like India and perhaps all of South Asia, where as Ila and Vishal pointed out yesterday, the research component is not strong enough in many of our architectural programs. Um, so we, we need more, many more schools with the capacity for research and curation to, to curate as in to put together seemingly disconnected bits to, to create new relevance. Uh, we believe that many of our programs are very important and resonate very deeply with the younger architects. We see the role of the foundation not only as advocating for a for a, a better urban environment, which is important, um, but but um, we you know we do work with the government on policy questions, etc. But also how we can support the making of the culture of architectural practice in the region, how setting up traditions, um, and and cultures of research cultures of archiving, cultures of discussion, and how ideas and themes can be talked about and articulated so younger people have uh, clarity in the way they deal with these questions. Thank you. Well, while the footstool is coming, I'll just say thank you so much uh, to Rahul and his entire team um, for this invitation and this uh, very thought-provoking, inspiring presentation. I'm very honored to be here. Um, my name is Shari De Silva. I'm the chief curator at the Jeffrey Bauer Trust. And I think we've already circled around this idea of when you study a discipline like architecture, which takes seven years of school and then additionally four years of logging hours, um, and we do it because we love buildings. To then step away from that is not easy. Um, and I was reflecting on maybe what led me to my on my path for this. I think it had a lot to do with me having to choose a major as an undergraduate in the US in 2009, which is the year the Sri Lankan Civil War ended. And it was a very difficult time to be away from home, to think about how studying a discipline like architecture could then have any kind of impact in a public realm. It felt impossible to do that through building because I felt there was such a chasm between public practice and between architecture. Um, and what I ended up doing was studying history, theory, and criticism of architecture as an undergraduate. Um, this, is, this is my desk from that year, uh, my dorm. And one of the uh, quotes that was written on those post-its is this one, I understand it's a little corny to quote Rilke, but I think this idea of living with questions and not uh, living, not looking for the answers uh, was and is, continues to be very important for me. And I think it was very fortuitous that then after 10 years of being away, moving back to Sri Lanka, um, I happened to come at a time that the trust was looking for a curator. The Jeffrey Bauer Trust was set up in 1982 uh, by the architect with the mission of fostering art, architecture, and ecology. And following his passing in 2003, the trust inherited his estate, which includes his house, number 11 in Colombo, um, his garden, Lunuganga, 80 kilometers south, um, and then a whole host of um, objects um, uh, which we're still cataloging. So these numbers will all increase as we continue the process. But what has been um, really revelatory about that process of making this and reconfiguring this as a collection is this intertwining between drawings, objects, and places. So this is a map of Lunuganga um, with many of these in the archive. Some of them exist really 
almost outside of the language of architecture drawing that we often rely on and that just incredibly evocative of place and our relationship with nature. Um, it's a very collaboratively produced um, repository of work. And I titled this talk Drawing from the Archives because I think in the last five and a half years, a lot of the work has been about um, these reflections and questions and speculations that have been prompted by the archives. I'm sharing here a quote by Bauer um, where he talks about not narrowly classifying things. And I think we could almost think of this same lens in the way we've been talking about South Asia, that we understand our history and our past as multivalent, multifaceted. And um, I also think it's a, in Sri Lanka to say something like this, when we have had such a um, divisive outcome of this kind of divide and conquer colonial strategy, it is quite important to be able to step back and say these there are large umbrellas that also apply. Um, I was also so happy that we spent a lot of time talking about maps yesterday because this one is the drawing that Jeffrey used to preface the first monograph of his work. And it's a map of the world. So that was a book in 1986 published by Nima. And it's a map of the world centered on Colombo. And I think it makes immediately clear that when you're talking about the center on a sphere, it really is just where you're looking from that defines north, south, east, west. Um, and I, I think for us today, we can look at these materials and draw conclusions um, of what it might mean to start a project with a map like this. Um, as we go through this process of archiving, we're very keen that we use this repository in a public way, that we engage with it today. So last year, we did the first exhibition that was focusing on the archives. It was called It Is Essential to Be There, and it was about this relationship between the archive, between these drawings and objects, and this idea of place, which was so key to Bauer's work, but I think is also the fundamental part of every architectural project. And by looking at the at looking at that idea through or through drawings and through the archives, um, what becomes apparent is that for Jeffrey site is not only a topographic geographic notion, it is also a political and ideological construction of place. Um, and because in Sri Lanka we have a very nascent museum going audience, when we did this over the three months that it was open, we did tours and talks and workshops every single day because we feel it's really important that if we're spending all of this energy looking at these works from the past, the real question is how is it relevant for today? How is it relevant for our future? And at the time that we did this in Sri Lanka was when things just began to collapse last year. And so even in the process of making the exhibition, we had to find out how do we do museum framing, museum lighting, archives, as you know, are very fragile materials. Um, but how do we do that using design as a solution um, and using materials that are available? So we, it was almost like a recursive thing where we would talk about this work with young architects while, it was, while we were living it ourselves. Um, we did a companion publication, and we were very keen that it was an anthology of texts written across disciplines, across geographies. And for me, um, a lot of my, I think, architectural work, something has happened to the slide, I apologize, um, is about, has come from an editorial perspective as we had uh, others speak about it as well. And this journal, which I co-edited when I was at Yale um, was called Medium. It was really this question of what is the format, the medium of architecture? Is it only buildings? And I would of course argue it isn't. And that way of trying to understand something in the medium that it exists has been true of the archives as well. As we look at these archives and the Bauer Trust is quite unique, I think uh, in Sri Lanka and even in South Asia, there aren't that many um, architectural archives. But we also find that if we keep the kind of traditional definition, it's not enough to talk about this work. Um, so we've also thought about buildings as archives. And I'm not going to talk about this project because I know Amila is going to take us through it tomorrow. But there was this project that was relocated. And it's a building that now exists as an archived version of itself. Um, we've also thought about how much of the work that is done in this part of the world is done orally. And it is not enough. To, there's very little that Jeffrey wrote, but we can 
through a series of ongoing oral histories, try and unpack the nuances and the complexities of something like, an, like a, a multi-decade architectural practice. Um, this year, Lunuganga turned 75, and we've spent a lot of time thinking about what Nunuganga meant to Bawa's practice. In many ways, it's the first thing he does. He starts work on it a month before Sri Lanka gains independence from the British, and then works on it for 55 years, his whole life. Um, and it's almost like a spine in his corpus that is has these interplays with other projects. So for example, the hen house that you see on the left is um, sometimes considered to be a maquette for the parliament building. And there is this Recur there is a, in, um, a reflexive quality between things that are happening in the garden and things that are happening in his practice, which is also part of our collective history. Um, we've also then had to consider what does it mean to have living objects in your collection? So the iconic Kranjapani tree at Vinuganga, um, which started off as a spatial marker, um, is this kind of evolving constant that we can use um, to, to navigate time, to navigate change. Um, and here you see from a photograph from very recently. And of course, it also then makes us really think about lifespan. Uh, we're working with fragile materials in one of the most destructive, extremely humid, extremely hot climates. So obviously not every, we're fighting against all of the elements to keep these things, but something like a tree, we can't keep. So we have to also think about what that means. And there's many ways in which the garden has also been a way of opening up um, these conversations in a way that I think is more accessible to our public sometimes than a building. We've also been thinking about the archives that we create. And one of the amazing things about Jeffrey's mandate is that for the trust, he has no, there's nothing of his own legacy. It is really about these disciplines. And if you think about the time that he was working, um, it was an in incredibly important, immediately post-colonial moment. And he had many brilliant contemporaries. And last year, in the height of uh, the crisis with a barely bare budget, we did these participatory programs, looking at these works where you don't have the traditional repository. How are the ways in which we can explore the relationships between places and objects and documents? So we did um, a wiki editathon. We did... Sorry, I just lost my slide. Um, we did open house. We the Bauer Trust does open house Colombo. Um, we did this one, which was a model. We worked with young artists to recreate um, through models, through some of them almost sculptural. And I think I'll end there, which is to say that one of the things we're finding as we work with this past and uh, these documents from the past is that some, not everything can be charted through words and writing, and we need to look at practices of making as a way of exploring these questions as well. Thank you. Yeah, this is good. This is good. Okay. This is good. Yeah. All right. So thank you everyone for having me here, organizers as well as the audience. I think I stand here in celebration. Um, not only do we have a panel on research and curation, we have two panels of research and curation at an architectural conference. And how much ever younger uh, practitioner I am, I see that as a very big, big movement. Um, on that same note, when I'm, you keep seeing this logo, it's not a protocol, it's not a promotion, it's to say this is not my work at all. This is a club of people, a group of people who have constantly come together and the least I can do is represent them through the collective curating for culture. Context, um, I think I'm going to skip all that Shari and Nandita have said, archives, why are they important, how are they built? I am jumping to what more. Um, and here is the context, um, a conversation from the pandemic. Um, Mary Woods had highlighted in her article that it's been, a, it's been timely in India to establish archives with an intention of them becoming agents of change. Um, two additions to that, I think it's true for South Asia, and that is how all these organizations that we are listening to over these two panels 
we have all started around the same time and here we are um, but i think it was it was high time it was not just timely um, and i'm glad that we took that concrete foot forward but since then i've also been troubled about the sense of this practice to everyday lives um, on one hand we have the raging attitude about erasing things about erasing different kinds of histories and on the other hand, and that's why we need more preservationists but on the other hand i have been working in this field and i'm like where are we making the dent how are we making the dent are we even making any change and that is why the question that the cultural fragilities have increased day by day whether it's about collective well-being whether it's about the unexplained comfort for war whether it's about ethnic cleansing and so on um will we just keep building archives to redeem ourselves um and i think i'm i'm fast forwarding i'm i'm in that in that rush maybe because tech seems to be changing things a lot so why can't our practices but on the contrary my own journey uh, would talk about how slow and immersive the practice has been um and as i would highlight it's not been so chronological nandita's presentation also reminded me that it was charles korea's archives coming to our iba when i was a graduate student that triggered everything um professor woods also mentions in her article that um i think she feels that i was very passionate about ensuring that architect hema sankalya's collection was well preserved perhaps yes as a woman to woman architect i really felt for it um women architects voices have not been heard or written about um it was also the smallest collection so i think that was also the reason but more importantly it came to life it was full of experiences it was full of emotions and on that note um i think it has been very important to look at lived narratives as a way of better cultural rooting um and that's been the purpose of building archives um this is to say that that would then make critical thinking also more informed rather than um just based on research from far away and it hopefully will not dismiss anyone so easily or anyone's lived experience so easily um what you see on the right is excerpts from um the project we have built um you all can scan the qr code it's a digital archive of 21 oral histories until now and hopefully we keep adding to this now this original proposal to gram foundation was intended to retrieve stories of the first generation women practitioners and again this one came through during pandemic so it was very uh, challenging to look for what does what didn't exist so we moved on when we started talking to the second generation women practitioners and the logic was why wait for things to become obsolete um in this process the idea of generation became immaterial the idea of practitioners expanded um spaces uh, the idea of space who constructs and what kind of spaces um that expanded sources um also were important we started thinking of others who might know of people who are not around but also questioning uh what would be the agency of the dead uh, when you think of building archives and oral histories about them this is to say that more deeper meanings or deeper questions sort of started emerging and one of them was also about what have been women doing for other women to grow in the fraternity now this is just an example of um you know deepening the critical thought and not just um not just pure for the sake of activism if i might call it so now there are two ways i could go from here um one is to tell you about the exhibition which emerged earlier this year to launch the archive um thanks to our chila foundation we had a one month log exhibition and what we did was we pushed the envelope we asked the women practitioners to look and dig up um physical archives to tell to to weave into the stories that they have told i'm skipping this one because the other direction which i could take you back and taking you back in time is the parallel process of curating biome diaries and they they coincide at quite a bit um again um we kept talking about there are not many uh, books written on women practitioners women architects and still we dared um, to question the idea of what an architectural monograph would be um luckily chitra and biome were all we were all on the same page that yes we would research we would document we would include more voices um but we will tell stories because ultimately the idea is about these histories or this research reaching common audiences i think even when i say common audiences it sounds so wrong it's almost saying that they don't understand but 
these are phrases we get used to. Um, so we've involved clients, collaborators, uh, former architects, um, I, even contractors from the team who have not only interviewed or been part of the research, but also written in the publication. Now, another option was to obviously show the nice pictures and the nice review of the book. But instead, I think I want to sort of highlight what RVC recently did, a very humble effort, the first version of a journal, Subversion, where they even questioned this experiment and went further um, for a book review, which is reviewed by the curator or the editor, and really kept me thinking about my connections with Bangalore, my reason to build archival practices and taking them to public. What I, I must end this part of the conversation is that I'm not saying this is a very good book. I mean, of course, I feel good about it. What I'm waiting for is, where is the critical discourse about publication? So it's been two years since this book has been out. And I wonder if the fraternity is ready to talk about such experiments or when will we be ready? In the meanwhile, um, uh, sorry, now I, I think coming back to self-criticality, um, we have also been looking at the responses we got. As I said, we wanted to meet the audience through the different projects. We have got responses where they said they felt represented with the exhibitions that they have seen or the oral histories or histories that we've collected. Um, especially with Biome Diaries, we got responses where they said, I don't need to be an architect to understand what's written. And we thought that was really in our stride. Uh, having said that, our criticality was constantly to find ourselves in these white or black cubes practicing what we were practicing, which keeps pulling us back, but we try to go out of it. And here's one of the community projects from Bangalore, uh, where we invited um, people in Bangalore to tell their stories of migration with the hope that we will change something about the socio-political narrative. We knew that we would first get responses from the middle class, and hence we worked further on meeting the non-urban dwellers, finding out stories of migration, which makes the cities what they are, the diversity, the athleticism. It's, it's what makes it fun, right? So I'm also a migrant in Bangalore, and I say it with a lot of pride. So the question always remained in our heads, which we wanted to put through to a project that life is as messy as I'm also making this presentation. So why do we keep designing and making buildings which are so pristine and clean? Um, coming back to what the exhibition looked like where community members pulled out garments, maps, drawings that they held on to, photographs. But this was done in a metro station. So what I said earlier, it was necessary for us to keep pushing ourselves out of the comfort zone. And when you come to a metro station, you talk about safety of histories, um, how safe history makes you feel. We wanted to see if it triggers a dialogue around designs of buildings, neighborhood, construction. And we didn't have to do it deliberately. I mean, if you listen to these rec recordings, it's all there. Um, where all of this started, uh, three years ago, we started a personal archiving program. Uh, it's a homegrown initiative. And uh, about 40 proposals came through, including Malaysia, Syria, Nepal, um, and about 20 projects were taken forward. We all, so skipping the um, incubation project, what it landed up into is of course a discussion series, which is there online, but also an exhibition right up here. Uh, as a part of the Koj Fellowship. And all these archives were sent here, uh, including some of the architects who look back at their personal lives or um, in memory of late architect Pradeep Sachdeva and what his archives mean today, but also a lot of personal archives of other community members. One such project from there is the Patni Archives project. And I get this question a lot that why are you working with an erstwhile Divan's family archive. And I think three years down the line, I think I have found some answers to that. Mm -hmm. We have worked with furniture, we have worked with places, family histories or personal histories are not divided of the spaces that we are all talking about. So tomorrow we launch the archive three years down the line. And what has been interesting is what you see, um, the, the insistence on working with vernacular or dual languages mm -hmm. or repurposing sites, repurposing materials, um, the whole exhibition, I take lots of pride right now saying this, the whole uh, exhibition has no foam board in it. And it was a struggle. It was really a struggle to every time say, we'll paint, we'll do this, but no foam board. What I'm trying to say over here is that patronage comes in many forms. It's not just resources and money. It's about values. It's about the relationship. 
And I wanted to end before the ending slide. I wanted to show this in response to the question I had asked Mr. Kanak yesterday. We were able to pull off these programs or such workshops and projects across uh, South Asian um, uh, collaborators. So that's from Pakistan, Mahvish and Yohan who are looking at Sinhala language as well as doing workshops for Britowa Trust in uh, Bangladesh. I don't have answers. I didn't mean to present today to say I started with a question, do spatial practices address cultural fragilities? I, I mean, I want that to be a question for discussion, but I do take uh, some comfort in this article which Anuradha wrote so opening with a MAG article and closing with one um, at a span of a year where um, Anuradha addresses this whole idea of shelter or the safety that we feel in historical narratives and how that could be revoked um, to build practices of today and tomorrow. I did it on time. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you all for your patience in uh, hearing out. I'm going to say thank you in advance because we're closing the session. Uh, also, thank you, Rahul, uh, not for so much the invitation, that of course, but nonetheless putting me in this session and asking me to provoke myself to think of myself as a curator. I have not curated any exhibition or any such research project. And so I started looking at um, some of this in a, in a more academic sense. And the position that I bring to the table here is that there is not adequate practice of research in architecture, particularly from within the profession. That's a very strong point that I'd like to make over here, despite having seen this whole morning session of people who are actually doing the research. The largest body of work in architecture is the physical built environment, right? Which is considered to be based on the craft practices of doing. In this then, the proposition is to expect and encourage a paradigm shift leading to the emergence of a mainstream practice of research. In its nascent stages, I expect that this practice of research will be based largely on empirical work, on the ground information collection, or a compendium of works, which is where we see a lot of work at the moment also. While going forward, one can aspire for theoretical premises to emerge, because that is what we are completely lacking for the moment. Frameworks for direction, organization, and the imagination of our profession. And that is where I would like to anchor today's conversation. When Rahul asked me to do this, this is what I did for myself. I started, in a way, checking where is it that I find myself as a curator or a researcher? The diagram is a resultant of that thinking, and I consider it work in progress. Sorry. The important parts of this diagram is to be able to find a location for policy and theoretical positions. The aspiration of the in research, all of this should be eventually to lead to policy. This is an area that very few architects or architecture practices ever venture into. One would like to see methods suitable for communication within and outside the profession. And today's morning session has shown many methods by which we can actually do this. They need to start getting organized. My personal research work has been to decode traditional Indian architecture, essentially to 
try to understand the knowledge of societies that is embedded in architecture because architecture is one artifact that stays for centuries. Within that, I got fascinated by the water structures of Jodhpur and this is what came out of that research. So this is the kind of findings of that research. This became my doctoral research, which then moved on to the idea of curating those findings. So I positioned the idea of a curator not as an exhibition curator, but what are the other things you can do as a curator? So to give talks and to create a wider and larger audience for the findings, to give academics and professionals body of work that they can use and to give it to the students because then it becomes an agency for them to take forward. Briefly, I will run through my research work. It's a five-year PhD doctoral work. 12 minutes are not going to do it. So, and I promised Rahul that I'll do it before the 10 minutes. Uh, this is in Jodhpur. If you look at uh, all, if you try to map all the water bodies that existed over there, one finds clearly a demarcation of a larger body of uh, these water structures in the north and northeast or northwest. If you look at the uh, topographical uh, and uh, the contour lines and all, you see that the city is designed to be downstream. Very simple logic. There are diverse types of water structures within that system. Within the city of Jodhpur, there are more than 400 water bodies. If you ask the common people, when we walk around, you will be pointed out to three or four. Why was the need for so many diverse types? Not just that there were so many in numbers, but why was the need for so many diverse types? And the value is in being able to ascertain the relationships between these types. One, of course, is to be able to understand them in the physical context of relationships. So there is a hierarchy of these water structures that have been designed. There are those which are deep in the landscape, which require less Maintenance, they all gather, create larger catchments, bring it to the reservoirs. The reservoirs then take it to the, again, a smaller set of water bodies like step wells and wells, which are within the neighborhoods. The types are located not only on the basis of terrain, but also other parameters, including, and so this work can start getting positioned in the idea of climate change, in the idea of ecology, many positions that emerge out of this. And the reason to use water structures as a case study was that most of the architectural history had focused on temples, religious monuments, and somewhat the forts and palaces. So I wanted to go into a space that was more anchored in the everyday. Placemaking in the city, these water structures create very important social spaces. And then, of course, one can go into a whole research on gender and space and water. This is uh, the work of a student who starts mapping. So it, this percolates into education. The student starts mapping whether these water structures are still being used or not. And clearly, they are. And eventually, what is it that one brings to the table? That these water structures that we see as isolated monuments of beauty are actually an infrastructure system. And that one of the most important things that we need to understand is that this architecture is interconnected, interconnected to so many layers. This is the kind of map that has emerged out of my research. I mean, clearly the fort wall is not the edge. The water flow does not acknowledge that fort wall. So there are two different layers of uh, boundaries that might exist. And that these water structures, which are part of the infrastructure, are multifunctional infrastructure, which is something that is yesterday Kanakji mentioned about the kind of banal infrastructure that we create. And here is an example of what infrastructure can be. which become an ecology. The whole term, therefore, which I was mentioning right in the beginning, what is the kind of theoretical premise that can be created out of a research work? And here, what was proposed was the idea of a spatial ecology. Which is then 
curating that research to put into the public domain in the idea of publications. Teaching. So I have, I run design studios that use water as a determinant of design at, at different scales, starting from the urban scale to a very small. And in the morning, it was nice to see uh, Rohan talk about Prusha's work and the spout. I was sending pictures to uh, Alexandra, Prusha's daughter, about his uh, the building. I have also been uh, part of teams that have been doing documentation, particularly in Rajasthan. Documentation is a team effort. All of you who undertake it know that. What this documentation essentially did was to run into practice of conservation. But today, now we look back at the 30 years of this archives that is sitting with us and conversations are going on about what to do with it. So ideas are most uh, welcome. We have, uh, I mean, it's a fairly large archive of, uh, of drawings that we have and uh, we have to put them together. I've learned so much about doing exhibitions and curating in this morning. I hope some of that will percolate down and we will do something about this in the near future. And all of this activity is undertaken through a nonprofit trust, which is at Adi Center, which also does these publications. This doesn't move. Okay, so it does these publications. And some of it, of course, uh, percolates into the practice because there's a practice which is uh, learning from this uh, research, but also disseminating. So in the center, what you see is part of an exhibition drawing, which uh, laments the loss of these water structures. But on the other hand, we're trying to build new ones. And there is a zoo project, but I am going to have deference to the zoologist <laughs> here. But we do collaborate with zoologists and uh, veterinaries, doctors, and all of those. So thank you. That's about it. Lights. Vandita, can we have you on screen? Can't see Vandita on the screen. Um, while this gets set up, uh, I've been told that a hundred people on uh, Zoom. So, if there's any question from the Zoom audience, do please leave it in the chat, and uh, we'll take it up at the end. We'll do a couple of questions, me and Vishal. Then we'll open it to the audience. And meanwhile, if everyone can, whoever wants to ask a question on Zoom can just leave it on chat, we'll take it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, thank you to everyone and thanks, Nandita. I know it's 2 a.m., 3 a.m. for you. So thank you for making that. Uh, but just some uh, things that uh, were very interesting and engaging from all your discussions, uh, especially from the first two discussions of uh, Jeffrey Bawa Trust and the CCF uh, archives is the idea of the tangible and the intangible archives. You know, often archives are just seen as something physical and the tangibility of it, but you both kind of brought out the idea of the intangible and partly even Ishita. So that's something which is uh, important to talk about when we talk about archives, because especially um, it's not just about the physicality of the material of the archive, but actually what it holds and what it represents. So what is, I mean, in the case of Charles Gordy and Jeffrey Bauer, what is, what do the archives kind of 
hold for of their legacy of their work of their design thinking and the second thing uh, is the idea of the oral histories i mean i know ishita keeps talking about technology and uh, the current generation you were just talking about the tiktok generation i mean they have very limited um, I shouldn't say that but uh, in a way you know oral histories become very interesting ways to engage with the newer generation it also speeds up the process of sharing um, so yeah it's an important tool when it comes to archives because uh, what i'm getting at is uh, you know the whole uh, practice of working with archives is very slow it's very very slow it end up uh, i mean you talked about spending 3 years uh, but often you spend more time just kind of working with archives and seeing what you can do with it um, but also archives the practice of archives is uh, a practice of continuity you know versus how we see mainstream practice of architecture how we even define mainstream is getting something built on site or you know seeing something physical on site so archives is more a practice which is uh, continuous you know you keep working on it uh, i know for the charles kuri archives like nandita said that we keep inviting researchers to come and work with uh, charles's work and i think they hold a lot of workshops and studios where you engage with uh, the housing projects of uh, charles kuri so in a way what i'm kind of asking is that uh, how do you see the practice of uh, archiving uh, which is more a practice of continuity fitting within the mainstream that we understand uh, within the profession as something which creates tangible and final products in some way yeah can i can i just add to that and then we you know so i don't have to make separate remarks uh, and then it, it just in relation to what uh, ila said it would be nice to frame also some of these points in terms of what you consider the pedagogical values of what you do and that's you know in four different domains so that's all from my end um thanks i think that one of the things that grounds our my my colleagues and my approach to the archives is that it only exists it's it's a bunch of documents but it only exists as an archive when we engage with it so i think yes it is a continuity but it is also constantly evolving to respond to its time and the people that are engaging with it um and i think that's also why we see the kinds of scholarship around archives and even architectural archives changing um and i think uh from the pedagogical perspective I, it is vital and it is also I think one of the ways in which we link to the mainstream and one of the things um that we're trying to do at the trust is to work with the schools of architecture to make the practice of using these materials um a pedagogical tool because in an ideal world research should then inform design um or inspire design and when I don't think we're there yet I think we're also in a process where we're still doing the the technical part of it of in terms of digitizing and cataloging and making it searchable um but i think that that having that kind of reciprocity is important and it's not that we only do these public programs for a general public or only for an academic or artistic community we always try and um work at all of those levels at the same time um so I feel like there was one more aspect to your question that I am leaving out but I think um what I would mainly argue is that we bring our own quest each of us as when we enter the archives or engage with them we're bringing in our own lenses so it it is also a very kind of fluid um thing in the end that gets conceptualized as what is the archive what what are the criteria you use to determine whether something is or isn't an archive um and we we actually like to use the ICA the international council on archives definition to say so when we did with my team this conversation of can we consider lunuganga to be part is it authentic is it reliable is it usable and it is only because we felt it was yes to all of those things that we then felt we could say yes actually it is part of an archive as well
Um, okay, so first clarification, I mean, I also started off, I think, thinking oral history are tools to archiving. I've come to a point where oral histories are archives. So I think that transition or learning has been very important. When it comes to engagement through oral histories, I've now noticed three kinds of engagement. One, for the interviewee themselves, because they almost start looking up the physical archives, the belongings that they want to talk about. So they start reflecting on their own work, which they could have otherwise just donated and detached from. But the oral histories become a way of telling the stories, the stories that we are all looking for. The second, the stories help the archivist immensely. I mean, I've not seen archives. Um, I mean, I've, I've seen the archives very differently once Hasmuk Bhai talked to me about how he designed it, or even the women architects, Veena Garela, took me through her reports. And now I know why that one article means so much. So when you are thinking of, and I think something that I waited to talk about is subverting the archive. In the morning, we talked about museum being the problem, the word. I think that is where the voice, whether it's ethnography, whether it's oral history, whether it's looking at it as an intangible value, it starts making that bent. It, it stops making the archive a black and white grid or an Excel sheet. You start seeing so many interrelationships. You start looking for so many keywords because now we are associating it with lived experiences, design process, and so many other subjects. Heard the audience, yes, they are the readers, um, definitely find um, audiovisual format more convenient to work with. But I still feel that because oral histories are very expansive, so I give them the benefit of doubt. I don't think anybody would listen to two hours of recording. Um, and that's where our role again comes in. And something that we have been exploring is how do we make oral histories searchable? So what kind of metrics do we develop where oral histories um, can be mapped the way you would map uh, a drawing or a photograph? Or So how do you start seeing them as tangibles and exchanging information? Um, continuity of uh, archiving, I've been writing about this, not reached anywhere, but wanting to say that it's a continued process because histories are constantly being made and constantly being lived and relived. So the same material starts holding more me different meanings, different forms of histories over time. So instead of seeing, and I think that sort of corrects the notion that these are places of dead memories or dead stories. When you start, when you start thinking the, of them as lived histories. So can I go back to the same architect five years later? Can I go back to the same building 10 years later? And can we keep building the narratives because the sociopolitics has changed, because the economic situation might have affected it? Um, and hence the archives are new, they are fresh. So what you read in 2015 archive and what you read in 2020 is adding to your information about that building and that project or that material. Pedagogical values, um, I can say only from right now, I think it's very young a practice for me, but we have felt that it works very well for practice-based workshops or uh, studios as well when we were working with UNESCO chair um, with at Shishti Institute. And we took the students to different kinds of heritage towns. Um, we created projects and provocations for them. And this very strong need of a historian to tell them about ethics and about privacy and about not being extractive, it sort of got taken care of when they documented or they worked with the communities to document their histories. They embodied the histories, they embodied the experiences. So I think for, for my experience, it's a lot of pedagogical value if the students are working with it themselves. Even the student assistants or TAs who worked with us during building SEPT archives. So when they come back 10 years later and they tell stories, I would need much longer time. But they seem to have learned something which we didn't even impart. And I think I leave it for that kind of self-learning, uh, seeing these practices as pedagogical modules. You know, pedagogy is a difficult word for me. Peda, child, I don't think any of my students will appreciate being called child. Uh, in terms of bringing value to education, I think um, I see a lot of this work, which is archived, has to be going through a sense of a filter. And I see the either the curator or the teacher as somebody who is doing that filtering. 
And that is where its complexity lies. Curating is not as innocent. And curating an archive is definitely not innocent. And therefore then, to convert that into pedagogies, to create more complexity even beyond just the immediate material that you have, because then it is perpetuation of that complexity. And it is passing it down through different generations of that complexity. And therefore then to say how these archives are going to contribute. I mean, who do you decide to archive? What do you decide to archive? Those are very complex questions. And then for me to be able to say that I have the Jeffrey Bauer archive or the Louis Barrigan archive available to me to be able to filter, that is where my questions come. Because I then ask myself, why is this material there? But I know that there must have been, as a practicing architect, I know there must be other material which is not here. And how do I then convert all of that into something that I can communicate to the student? That is where I find pedagogical questions. I don't have the answer per se. The answers to me sometimes maybe come when you engage with that material at a personal level. For example, when I looked at those water bodies or when I did my PhD research, the agenda was not to do the PhD or the research per se. Uh, the agenda was what value does that have for us today? And not in a nostalgic sense. Really in a, in a concrete being able to put into action way. That is one part of that idea. The other part of the idea, and which I think up, and this part of the idea is actually beginning to get traction. So we are seeing more research, we are seeing archives. The difficulty is in creating the place, the in sense of incubation within pedagogy, within teaching, for ideas that may not seem to have action today. You know, I received this uh, newsletter from Sock Institute. Uh, I think that December closing before holidays newsletter. And uh, they were celebrating the idea of a $50 million uh, grant that they've received to study one, some strand of some gene, which nobody knows how it's going to get used for at least another two decades. Now, where is the idea of that kind of research embedded in architecture? What are those ideas and how do those get potential agency in the student body? Because that is where new ideas, new ways of living, new futures and new aspirations are embedded. So I think these are the kind of questions that I personally kind of... <laughs> Dantata, you want to go take this? No, I mean, I, I think I... I said, you know, like I, I think that the, the tangible archives uh, have a certain value, and um, and and they are good for that. But I feel like that is more a uh, one on one. Like you need to know what you are trying to research. You're not going to stumble upon something so easily. Um, I think it's the intangibles is to understand perhaps in a in a more abstract. Um, what in 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 our case, what what Charles was thinking, what his what his writings were about, but it, I I'm not so sure it's about um, you know, just looking at the plans and stuff like that. I mean, there are books that that uh, also synthesize all that. So so actually, looking at the original drawings, um, I I don't know whether perhaps they are nuanced, but it, I think you need. To know what you're looking for, I think that's what I'm saying. It's just it's not something that you you just need to have access to. And in any case, for us, we we don't have access to the original drawings anymore. They they are in London, and you can go. I think Vishal is thinking of going there to to look at them. But but uh, you know, and and that's at a different scale. Is is looking at the, those drawings and stuff is worth doing. But yes, you need to go with an agenda, I think, to to understand what you're looking for. And and that's what that's what exhibitions help you do that. 
you know it's they they are opening up uh what the what the curation has been yeah great so we can have some questions from the audience as well as from the zoom members so one right here so kaiwan and then one at the back uh one in the middle He wanted to avoid me. Yeah, no, thanks for a second wonderful panel on the morning themes being connected. I just wanted to uh, say one thing that, you know, as much as what everybody's saying and everybody is doing is absolutely uh, important, uh, and we may have to speed this up uh, as a as a profession, as a as a larger field of practice, is professionalizing this whole process and all these activities that we are talking about. Uh, and I think it's it simply means to say that, you know, it's not about doing away with the museum term, but understanding what the museum term has sort of changed over in the last 150, 150 years. And how will we address the space of the museum? Because uh, irrespective of the term, what, what is happening in the building in Nepal is wonderful and it shifts the ground uh, already. Uh, uh, another thing like, for example, oral, oral history. Oral history actually has itself a history and it comes from working in, in very particular conditions. I think in the case of India, even if I'm to use an academic term, it comes also from subaltern histories and subaltern studies. And, and there were reasons to move to oral history. It was not uh, it was not just a medium as an alternative, but it, there were reasons. Now, when we are trying to write institutional or more structured biographies through oral history, then the meaning of oral history also changes. So I think some of these some of these questions, uh, uh, in, including like to know what you're looking at in a, uh, the the history of looking at drawings, what has visuality. Uh, visuality meant what did it mean for somebody in the 1950s making a drawing than somebody making a drawing in 1990s it is it is not the same notion of making an architecture architecture drawing so i think in in some ways uh, schools or education programs will have to take up the responsibility of professionalizing what we may be seeing as passion but passion is not always enough to uh, to structure a, a field and a space of discourse. The professionalism is also necessary. I just wanted to make it as a point, but if anybody wants to comment, fine, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Sarovar. Uh, I actually just wanted to, um, I'm not an architect, so this is not an architecture question. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I wanted to, kind of ask the panelists because they work at different forms and thresholds of thinking about the archive a classical kind of a Foucauldian question of what is how do you think of the archive as power and how a power who's in, in a sense who holds the archive who makes the archive whose archive it is um, and and, and and one side the archive is about power and the other side it is disempowering because it excludes right and this is the tension that we always see um <clears throat> and uh, just like you know in architecture i teach in architecture school there's this there's always this notion of the tangible and the intangible and i always tell my students that the intangible is like 10 disciplines of humanities <laughs> which is you know like how do you fold that into your uh, thinking on the built and the architectural. Um, also, just because one is discussing the idea of archive and power, and I think that's very, very important in the field of architecture because um, actually both Kaiwan and I have worked on an area in Bombay, which is in a sense the least archived. Uh, he worked on Bhuleshwar, I worked on Bindi Bazaar, and <clears throat> um, while well, the colonial city is the most archived as uh, in Bombay. Um, and how does erasure work in architecture? Here it means everything from actually the demolition of buildings to not having an archive of it. So, yeah. 
that's kind of broadly the Thank you. I'm Jarna Josie from Architect from Nepal. I have a question for Nandita, and um, she just mentioned it in uh, at the end about conservation of Charles Courier works. And I'm one of one of those who like um, signed the um, signature campaigns and make uh, you know share it with all my network to sign it questioning if it makes any difference. Uh, but you also mentioned that you were um, doing and trying to do more than that. I was just wondering what um, else you're doing, like trying to save the 20th century and later architecture when we have so much of these 100 year old buildings around. Thank you. Isaac Matthew is asking, research in and from practice does not have any imagination at the moment unless there is some institutional patronage. What are the mechanisms to make this change happen that more architects in practice are encouraged to research? Um, yeah, I... Also, I mean, mine, like Kai wants, is more an observation. I feel like uh, this panel has uh, opened up um, this space between the black box, right, of research and what happens in the process of research and the white cube, in some sense, the gallery, the exhibition space. And in many ways, the curatorial practice is positioned between those two. Um, and it becomes like... Um, uh, you know, as as many of the comments have uh, has, have also said, even the last one, um, it becomes uh, a kind of an uh, intangible but really imperative space um, that has to. Uh, you know, that I'm so glad that it's coming out in this uh, in this panel and partly the uh, the panel in the morning as well. Um, that the the connection that what is research cannot be made unless we have. Um, you know, these steps or these spaces. So. Do you want to start? Nandita, you can start as well. Yeah, okay. yeah Nandita can start. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I'd say the, the reason we are doing this uh, listing of, of 20th century buildings is because, um, you know, as you know, the Hall of Nations was torn down. Um, because um, when it went to the Supreme Court, the, the judgment reads that um, we cannot protect uh, a building that is less than, I think the minimum is 75 years old, which at that time meant that there was no building in independent India that could be protected. And, um, you know, I mean, all, I mean, the architects were up in arms, but but if you read the the judgment, it's very clear that um, you know the Supreme Court couldn't even hear the case um, because there is no law to protect these buildings. So we we every time this comes up, we can we, we can sort of panic and run around and try. And yes, we did a signature campaign for Kalai Academy. You can only do it for public buildings because you, they are the government is kind of accountable to not to you as the architect, but to, um, you know, to the public for for squandering public funds. So they really should be maintaining these buildings and 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 you know looking after them. But we still don't have a law to protect them. In the Kala Academy, they made a mess of it. We we won the the case uh, at the I, at the High Court um, in Panjim. It's the Bombay High Court in Panjim, uh, and it was the first time um, a twentieth century building actually got protected by law. So that was a huge landmark case. But right now, as we speak, uh, uh, the the cricket stadium that that Charles and Mahendra Raj designed. Uh, is going to be knocked down. There's nothing we can do about it. We've tried um, 
you know, World Monuments Fund had, had done a report and stuff like that. There's nothing we can do because there's no legislation. So, you know, I think as as architects, we we're the only ones who can actually um, uh, review and list these buildings. No one else is going to understand. So if we don't do it, they're all going to go one after the other. And and you know, we we all the time then have to beg of some foreign architects and, and architectural critics and stuff to step in um, and, and write something and put pressure on, you know, from an international viewpoint. But but really, um, we're going to lose a lot of these buildings. So I, I just, you know, I, I think it's high time we do this listing. And it has to be done uh, state by state. You need people who are willing to list and and um, and and Ela was part of the thing doing, doing buildings in Maharashtra. It can't just be by city because that's not that's not the way uh, the legislation would work. It has to be the jurisdiction would be of the state. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to try and connect all the questions. It seems like there's a possibility, and if I fail, um, excuse me. But I think uh, one of the powers that I have been experiencing, or rather I speak for the larger collective, including the community participants, archive has the power to project care, not project. I think it shows care. Project would be still a wrong word. It's a space of caring for the buildings we make, uh, buildings somebody else's might have made, buildings in which uh, lived stories are told or left behind or forgotten. So. I would imagine the power of care being very instrumental in resisting the erasure that we are also concerned about. One option is, yes, if it really has to be raised, if it's not in our hands, at least we have cared for it to be there down in the history rather than just erasing it because there are many more buildings. We know of Hall of Nations. We know things happening at Sanskar Kendra. These are still known buildings. There are so many unsung architects and practitioners whose works don't even get that kind of an attention when they are erased. If we were to care for these histories, at least they would remain in one form of memory. But the second option, obviously, is um, to avoid the erasure. If there were enough stories to tell, if there were enough people associated in these archives, and if it was not just about the architect and the architectural fraternity, but how the public connected with Hall of Nations or how they felt about, um, I forget the name of the building, uh, Charles Correa's building in Goa. Um, if people could have, if people's emotions could have been associated with, then these buildings would have been a little more difficult to take down. I want to really believe so. And when I think of the idea of care, I think the care can be generated just like we do in our own domestic lives through dialogue, through a space where we come together. I agree with Kaivan earlier when he said certain forums are for us to talk within ourselves, but we need more forums to talk with others. We talk with other disciplines, we talk with other community members and listen to public opinion. They have really a lot of things to say. It really opens up our minds. And for that dialogue, one would fall back onto research and curation. So that is where the white box or not a white box on a street or a choraha becomes very important that you go with curated plans or information, curated proposition that let's meet over chai and talk about why Hall of Nations was important to you. And you would be surprised the kind of conversations that come up. These sound like very fun cultural events, but they really are sometimes very intense. We have heard people share quite personal stuff about a public space. Um, and for that, I, I, I could just agree that yes, research and curation does need professionalism. I would just be a little skeptical about the question uh, about uh, or rather agree with the question about not just seeing the professionalism coming from institutional patronage. We need more decentralized uh, sources of support. Um, we need more art foundation. We need more architectural foundations. We need uh, foundations or support which will not tell me what I am supposed to say with that research, allowing for more sociopolitical thought to emerge. We need that decentralized um, because otherwise I'm very wary of professionalism as a word. It would put me back into a black and white jacket. It has done to us as a profession. Um, I mean, I don't mind saying it. So I would be very careful of professionalism. Yes, in terms of rules, in terms of not diluting research as a field, definitely, but not professionalism at the cost of not having a say. 
that's how I would like to answer all four. I mean, you can comment yes. I'm sorry, but I will have to a little bit disagree with the idea of being professional in research. That is exactly been our problem. We have dilly dallied around this term of being professional in research. We have not created established protocols. We have not allowed ourselves to become vulnerable because established protocols allow people to then look at what we are trying to do. We have not been able to establish a value for these buildings, which is outside ourselves, which is what I was trying to say earlier, that most of our work is self-referential. You and me can talk to each other forever. And uh, we've not been able to, and unfortunately or fortunately or whatever, I don't know how to make a value judgment on that. The world today is expecting a lot more in terms of being able to uh, be given reasons for why something can exist or not. Many of these reasons are in, in a sense have become very quantitative. And we have not created the matrix or the definitions for the quality that we appreciate. And therefore then, how do we expect somebody else to understand what is the value of that particular building that we seem to value a lot? Mm -hmm. They may have a few people on the street may have personal associations that for that to become a protocol to get legalized, is a big step and is a lot of hard work that will need to be done. And if we try to abstain from that responsibility of being diligent, being protocol-based, we will lose the opportunity and many more such edifices because I know that it's not just the cricket stadium on the list, there are 10 other buildings on the list, right? So, and it's not just the 20th century architecture, it's the question of what we value in architecture and for too long it has remained a myth and mystical i mean that's the researcher yeah, position yeah, we're, as going an to, we're going to take one last comment from narayani gupta and then i will close thank you narayani yeah. Yeah. So this video gossip yeah, on december gathering um I just want to welcome you to the world of the archives. You're all sounding a little nervous about it. Now, believe you me, I've spent many hours falling asleep over documents in the National <laughs> Archives, and at the end of it, produce something which I call the thesis. Um, you know, it is fun. And don't worry about the quantity being too much. The National Archives needs seven miles of space to accommodate all their stuff. They never get to do it. So you'll have the same problem. And there are ways of digitizing and economizing on space and so on. I don't need to tell you about it. So please do this. This is an extremely important thing to do, to have the story of our architecture archived. And uh, then you can decide what is worth, you know, highlighting in that and take it to your museum and so on. Uh, there's one other small point. I'm not sure whether I got it right but about modern buildings not being protected, I think this is a very serious matter because um, simply because it's five years old or 10 years old, it doesn't make it bad architecture and therefore removable. And you should give serious thought to this. I think you all have been, there's been a rather long silence um, when you could have got into a good discussion of where architecture and transition is going. I mean, we want to hear that. I mean, uh, the method, the archives is fine. But now get down to being responsible, please, and <laughs> discuss things without any kind of personal bias, but in terms of public spaces, because we are losing them. We are losing our public spaces. And if you don't do something about it now, you never will. Thank, thank you, you Narayani. Thank you very um, much. Rahul, just I, I, before we close, I just want to say that like, we're all talking about really with the, in the Indian context that with these buildings are not protected. I'm just wondering in South Asia, is that is that true right through? Is that true in Bangladesh or, or Sri Lanka? Or what does the law say there? Because it's just India that, that perhaps has this, this um, kind of bullish attitude of not protecting. It's absolutely the same in Sri Lanka as yeah. well. The law is a building that is built before 1815 is legally required. Between 1815 and 1915, 
if it has historical importance, it may be required. But anything after 1915, which is our entire modern architecture history, mm -hmm. is not legally required. The project that Amira will talk, I, I won't go into it, but it, it the, the moving comes out of that context. Um, so Jeffrey Barrow's work, Minette de Silva's work, none of it is legally protected. And it has, we have seen both the power of, of a voice of architectural communities in saving um, in the instance of the Ina de Silva house, but also we've lost many. And I think to that, I would just add that as an institution, I think even as an organization, but certainly for the Bio Trust, the idea is not to be the voice, it's to be the year. Um, and what we do through these programs is to bring people to have differing voices um, because the conversation is so key. And I think that is very much then tied to the question of conservation, the question of repair. And also as an institution working in this discipline, what are our roles in enabling the practices needed for conservation, the skills needed? There's research, there's archiving, but there's also very material skills. Um, and all of those, and one of the things when we look at Bauer's practice through the archive is understanding the way he was able to sustain other kinds of craft, creative art practices. Um, and I think as a discipline, we have a role in all of that. Um, but archives kind of help make that very palpable. Um, and I think that is why we we do have to have programs. We do need to bring in differing voices to understand um, how we proceed. No, thank you. So I'm just going to make two very quick comments, even though we have lunch. I'm sorry, we're running out of time. We can pick up on this. One was just a clarification, Ishita. Uh, the Color Academy didn't get knocked down, and sorry. it's not got knocked down at all. And in fact, what one can learn from the Color Academy, even if I may say that, although I have not been part of the process, but observed it very closely, is it was a combination of going to the high court, it was a combination of getting 10,000 or 15,000 signatures. 25,000. 25,000 signatures. It was a combination of getting critics from around the world writing about it. And that, that kind of coming together pushed even the high court, even though it wasn't a listed building to do it. So I think one can learn from each of these cases and each of these cases, the Hall of Nations, they have different situations, different constituencies. And I think this is something why these discussions are important. And Narani, thank you so much for your push to us as a profession, but you used a very important word, responsibility. And I think that's key. And I think the intention of us having and dedicated two full sessions and a whole half day to the practice of curation archiving was exactly that. You know, people we've heard are at the cutting edge of this, so to speak. There are many people who do it more sloppily. Uh, and I say that again as a provocation. And I think we haven't as a profession discussed, like when we build a building, we are responsible for its structure and its integrity. But when we practice curation research, we don't have the benchmarks that can hold us responsible in the way and the rigor with which we perform these activities and the advocacy that we follow up with which is also important. And I think the profession has to take on that onus, which is a very powerful message that you've shared with us. So thank you all. We will meet, it's exactly 1.30. We'll meet at 2.30 after lunch. For everyone in the audience, there's lunch outside. So please help yourself to lunch and be back here by about 2.25 so we can start exactly at 2.30. Thank you all.